already start there. So, okay, now we are live on, on, on YouTube as well. And I'll be following the uh, YouTube chat. So for those of you who are on YouTube, if you want to make questions, just put on the chat and I'll bring here to this other audience. So today we have Dr. Nuvarol or Noor, my friend from Bloomington. He's gonna present his work about modeling individual and group behavior online. He's one of the father of Botometer, a very famous bot detection system. He'll probably talk a little bit about, about it. So Nu is an assistant professor at Sabanchi University and the principal investigator at the Viral Lab. So Nu did his postdoc in Ottawa Eastern in the Center of, of uh, Complex Network Research. Onu did his, his PhD in informatics in Bloomington, Indiana University, that's where I met him. I think I, we coexist for just maybe a few weeks or a few months, but then we, we kept collaborating for a while. Anyway, Onu is a very nice guy, very smart and bright, and he'll talk a lot about this, his work. I'll stop talking and give the opportunity to him. So just one more thing, Onu, how do you prefer to handle questions like on the fly or do you prefer to keep for the, the, the end? Uh, I think at the end would be great. So then we can have, maybe there will be an overlap so I can uh, answer uh, the shared uh, okay. general teams and go back and forth uh, for different slides if we, I need to show additional uh, information. Okay, so if you have any questions, you can put on, 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 on the chat and then we will get on the end or, until, or you wait by the end and we unmute yourself and just make a question, okay? So thank you, thank you, Anu. Thank you, Diego. And this was a great, really warm uh, introduction. So I'm uh, thankful for your invitation as well. So today, as you, as you mentioned, like I've been uh, one of the members of uh, Network Agents and Networks Group, also known as Awesome Team at Indiana University. So I'm going to uh, talk about some of my work uh, during my time at Indiana and some of the work that I uh, did uh, at, uh, after uh, my time in, at Indiana University. And uh, initially when Diego invited me, I was hoping to share some of the recent results in my team at uh, Sabanji University. So we still need a little bit more time to kind of like prior to submission of the uh, results to share them with you. But today uh, I'm also give some hints and uh, kind of like background on, on these projects as well. And uh, the title of the talk is like modeling individual and complex behavior in, uh, uh, in uh, complex interactive systems. And uh, this is kind of like an uh, umbrella term since in my group, we are uh, interested in studying misinformation and uh, online manipulation social bot detection and other types of automated activities, the malicious automated activities going on in different uh, platforms. And uh, during my postdocs and uh, pretty much towards the end, of, end uh, of my PhD, I also involved in projects uh, deal with mental health research and, uh, uh, and analyzing well-being and science of science. And currently in our uh, lab, we are also touching uh, these topics for the research. But the brief outline is, I'm going to introduce the botometer, the evolution of botometer uh, over several years. And one of the studies that I conducted uh, on Twitter to quantify large scale uh, bot ecosystems. And I believe this is still the, the largest study ever done on, on Twitter. And we did a case study on 2016 US presidential election demonstrated different uh, bot strategies, behaviors uh, for these electoral systems. And I'm gonna talk about like some of the research plan that I've been doing in my research group uh, dealing with uh, human behavior and how we can leverage online and offline data. So starting from like going back to an historical perspective, which I always like to relate uh, when we talk about technological systems, the newspaper was, they say, one form of communication with the telegram. It gives us an opportunity to, to bring people to the public spaces where politicians can address to a uh, crowd of people to communicate their opinions and, uh, and ideas. And with the development of technology, with telephone, radio, tele, uh, televisions, 
we start to see different uh, types of communication. So in 1922, we see the first American president like uh, reaching to a nation through radio. We see with the television, the first online debates and the political advertisement, which is, I think, an interesting turning point for the, for the political communication as well. And with the, uh, in the age of internet, uh, things get a little bit uh, different. So being from one to many uh, communication medium, now people, voters, uh, uh, citizens can also participate in these political debates. They can go on Reddit, they can go on Twitter and share their opinions, interact with these political candidates. Even the political candidates among each other can uh, fight having a debates on, on this platform. And uh, this brings a different dynamics on these systems as well. One of which is social bots, uh, the automated technologies that we can generalize, because we know uh, from different case studies, evidences, the so so social bots have been used to manipulate stock markets. They have been used for uh, political smearing campaigns, astroturfing. Uh, the politicians can purchase fake followers to look more credible or, uh, or popular. And nowadays, it's almost not, uh, not a surprise to see social bots being used for marketing, spamming, and social pollution. But one thing that really worries me is their use of uh, social bots affecting mood and behavior of individuals. And this is where we need to be really careful. And one of the other factors when we are talking about social bots that I wanted to uh, make it clear at the very beginning is people tend to see social bots as a binary uh, system. Something is either a social bot or either organic human being activities. But what we are really uh, promoting, the idea of social bots can be somewhere in between as well. So it's a spectrum, how much automation one can use. So there might be accounts, uh, the content uh, is generated fully by humans, but the network automation can be uh, scripted. So who to follow, who to unfollow can be uh, controlled by uh, computer uh, programs. Or even nowadays, some profile pictures can be generated uh, using deep learning technologies, text, or the engagements, interactions can be automated uh, through uh, deep NLP technologies as well. So it's always uh, good to keep in mind this human bot uh, ecosystem have uh, captured different types of dynamics. So there's no one type of bots in these systems. And in order to quantify, we first need a tool. So this is like really back in 2016, 17, where we started to build the botometer. Uh, at that time, me, uh, Clayton, and uh, our PIs, uh, Emilio Ferrara, we were developing this tool uh, called Botometer to identify automated uh, user activities. So there was like several uh, rounds of updates with these systems where we int introduced new features or different training data set. But the main goal was uh, always the same. We wanted to quantify how much automated activity an account may contain. In my case, uh, my bot scores is quite low. This is uh, luckily indicates I behave more human likely in, uh, on these platforms. You can check out different accounts. You can check the followers or friends of these accounts to really uh, benefit from these tools for the research or, or, or uh, any other activities uh, to study uh, complex social systems. And when we start building Botometer, it was a uh, supervised machine learning activity. So I extracted uh, over a thousand of features capturing various different aspects of a uh, social media account. And at the time, my only goal wasn't uh, detecting social bots. The same model, the same set of features with different training data sets also used with quite high accuracy to separate uh, organizational accounts versus uh, human accounts as well. But the popular model that we have been using is for, uh, for bot detection purposes. And we touch upon extracted features from user metadata, looking at their friends, uh, some uh, level of content and sentiment features, and we extracted features from different type of network and temporal informations. And in order to kind of like bootstrap such a model, we first start all of the existing training data set. And one of the most uh, accessible and popular one at the time was uh, by James Caverly. So they were uh, using an um, approach uh, of honeypot strategies. So they were releasing uh, accounts. They are basically uh, creating gibberish content, the text, should, text that doesn't mean anything. And they look at who follow an account producing only gibberish content. And they identify those accounts being uh, uh, social bots. They label them as bots. And they also have a counterpart uh, of the data set where they uh, also label humans. 
And we start with such labeled data and uh, basically evaluated our different sets of features, how they perform uh, in these different learning algorithms. And the user and content metadata was the most uh, informative one uh, on this setting. But later on, we built our own annotated data set as well, starting from the models trained with the Caverly, we go and collect a random sample of accounts. We uh, compute their botometer scores. And for each decile, we resample some of these accounts and to make sure like we are not only focusing on obvious humans or obvious bots, we wanted to sample from the uh, more challenging, the ones that are kind of like confusing the uh, models as well. And when we train on this model, one thing that we uh, realize, uh, and you can also see with the blue curves, uh, five years apart, two different data sets, according to model perspective, the human behavior doesn't really change much. Two random sample of human uh, set groups, the botometer score is pretty much the same. But the other thing that we observe is uh, the recent bots that we identified, the ones that are more challenging, uh, the more sophisticated, are harder to detect by the model. That motivates us to iteratively update the model, creating a new set of feature, creating a new uh, data set, and uh, make this uh, bot, train, bot, uh, bot detection model training procedure as an ongoing process. And that kind of like lead us to develop different versions of Botometer. With the Botometer 3.0, we incorporated different data sets. We look at the ones where we can have a better accuracy in uh, separating human and bot accounts. Uh, with uh, 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 help of Kevin and other graduate students from our team, we look at how we can augment different data sets in order to find in which scenario we can build a model that are specific to the test. So there was a model selection component uh, of this uh, approach. Also, we develop uh, specialized models uh, to address and challenge. So previously, we, were, we tried to create a one model that can capture different uh, human and bot behaviors. But what we realized uh, throughout, throughout the years, some of the bots behave different than other bots. So we need to design models that are specialized to identify certain bot behaviors. So in our recent version of the botometer, uh, we tackled this problem. We built these specialized models to uh, identify different bot behavioral dynamics. And of course, uh, our systems sometimes make mistakes. Uh, neither the humans nor machine learning models are perfect. And we try to understand where we do make mistakes to kind of like uh, improve on these uh, points. So for instance, as humans, when we think uh, from an annotator perspective, like these computational power and memory, we cannot really incorporate uh, all the data that we may observe from a profile. Uh, machine learning models does much better job on these so they can uh, see uh, patterns that might not be obvious for many human uh, annotators. And similarly for uh, machine learning models or from the uh, discrepancies with the annotation, some of the very active users may uh, lead some of the false positives. We see co accounts using connected apps. Some of the business professional, uh, they belong to real human beings, but sometimes uh, they may be using uh, automation technologies. Uh, similarly, for false negatives, organizations and some accounts with foreign language tweets have uh, those uh, challenges as well. So currently, I'm trying to address some of these limitations, how to incorporate uh, tweets from uh, foreign languages or different types of uh, both behavior better in, uh, in my research. So... Uh, these are some of the summaries, like some of the papers related to Botometer. And uh, in a large scale study, so once we have this uh, tool instrument to detect and identify social bot accounts, we can start look uh, a large system. We uh, conduct the study over a 14 million active English speaking Twitter accounts. And we try to address some of these problems. We try to estimate for the first time, uh, what's the fraction of bot likely accounts on Twitter? And we could ask, what's the information flow between them? Does information spread from humans to bots or bots are spreading these information? How are they connected to each other? And uh, can, that, can we identify different behavioral clusters of these uh, social bot accounts? And in order to estimate the bot population, we start by uh, training models with different sensitivities to different uh, bot activities. So by... Uh, incorporating different levels of uh, complex bot uh, behaviors in the data set, 
we have models that are more forgiven uh, to some bot behavior and the others are more restrict, uh, strict for uh, identifying bot years. And by looking at these different range of uh, model uh, models, we estimated 9 to 15 of 9 to 15 percent of these active uh, English speaking social uh, user uh, users on Twitter being uh, social bot uh, like behavior. So they've been using automated activities. And in order to kind of like also talk about the uh, interaction between human and bot accounts, I just gonna show one illustrative figure to make it easier to follow the following slides. So here on the x axis, we have the botometer score and the y axis showing the distribution. So for us, we uh, are expecting to see human accounts having lower bot scores. So these are the ones uh, models are assigning lower scores. Some accounts that are uh, harder to distinguish gets uh, um, higher scores, but not uh, in the range of like really uh, higher scores. So we call this a sophisticated, more complex behavioral accounts. These are more trickier cases for the model. And the simple uh, bot, so the model can easily assign with high confidence, high score, 0 0.9, or almost one. And these are like different uh, type of behaviors that we may observe uh, when we are looking at a collection of uh, accounts. And in order to quantify the information flow, we can uh, ask two things. Like if we take a group of accounts, let's say only taking in uh, humans, uh, or, uh, accounts identified as humans by botometer, and these are the uh, dark blue curves, or obvious bot accounts. So these are the yellow or orange curves. And we ask for those accounts, uh, who mentioned them? Or, uh, and we, uh, we can see like human accounts tend to mention other human accounts. And they kind of like interact with each other. But when we look at the retweeting behavior, we observe something different. Humans are uh, also engaging with both accounts. So they retweet other humans, but also they retweet both content. But for the simple bots, they only retweet each other. Though. So this is kind of like one interesting observation for simple bots. They avoid making uh, interactions through mentioning other bots or humans. So uh, they prefer simple mechanisms of information diffusion like retweets. And for social connectivity, uh, we have similar, like uh, not really surprising uh, in terms of like who follows whom. So people tend to friends with uh, other uh, humans, bots tend to friend with other bots. But one thing that's interesting when we look at the reciprocity between them. So when we compare friends and followers and the overlap between these two groups, humans tend to have a high reciprocity rate. So most of your friends uh, on Twitter also following you back. So you don't uh, surprise to see high reciprocity because you kind of like having these mutual uh, relation uh, with your followers. But for the simple bots, we observe uh, two different extreme cases. So some of the bot accounts have really low reciprocity rates. So they keep following people, but they never follow back. So their activities are following pretty random or they may have a high reciprocity rate, extreme high reciprocity rate. That means they might creating these clicks, everyone following each other. So building these tight uh, bot uh, groups to promote or uh, support each other's activities. And in terms of account behavior, we could also use our feature sets that we uh, feed into Botometer and look for a lower dimensional projection and see how these groups are different from uh, each other. Uh, by investigating some examples from these different uh, cluster. What we realized, some of the accounts that we observe is a self-promoting account. So these are business professional recruiters. So they may look like uh, to belong in human account, but they are using these automation technologies to create content or engagements. Some obvious spam bots that we observe, some of the uh, groups that we observe uh, is a mix of sophisticated bots and cyborgs. So they have some human organic activities, but they have been also using automated activities. And one interesting group that is kind of like outliers and also motivate us for uh, further research question is accounts that use automated apps. So those are accounts uh, when we investigated them look like belonging their real human accounts. But uh, these accounts at some point become dormant. So their owners are no longer using Twitters. But before they do that, uh, they connected their Twitter account with some third party app. They connected it with Spotify, YouTube, some other services. And these services keep posting on their behalf because they give these credentials to those apps. And 
uh, from a bot detection standpoint, when we look at the last activities and keep saying similar content with a regular interval, that is kind of like an automated activity which was controlled by these third party apps. And it's also a concern for us. Uh, Twitter uh, could do a uh, uh, more careful uh, procedure when they are allowing these third party apps uh, being an active after even after the accounts uh, turn into a dormant because there are risks involved. So there might be third party apps waiting for an, uh, like a bomb, uh, waiting for these accounts being dormant and they might be used for manipulating trends. Uh, creating or following mass uh, following activities. So uh, I always here wanted to share my concerns about these third party applications on this uh, platform. And uh, before like when we talk about elections, I think it's also think about like what are the components of a political system? So from a, a government point of view, what they really want is like they want their interest of their citizens, they want economic stability, public also wants to elect the candidate that represents their values and opinions. And uh, since I will talk about uh, a little bit of the journalists as the next study, uh, they want to inform the public, they want to write important issues. But uh, what in reality happens is like uh, government wants to get reelected, journalists want to have large readership, uh, they care about their personal branding, they wanted to be the first to break the news. And all these dynamics uh, introduced the use with the use of online social systems is creating uh, different incentives and uh, different concerns for us. And particularly from the social bot activity uh, point of view. So we see lots of papers, evidences coming from like in the past five to 10 years, uh, how social bots have been used to uh, manipulate online uh, act campaigns especially recently about uh, dissemination of fake news and uh, uh, infodemics and the spread of like uh, the conspiracy theories as well. So in order to study such uh, activities, uh, the awesome team built a tool called Hoxie and Hoxie has been using Botometer in their backend to identify when they are looking for the dissemination activities, any piece of information spreading from one user to the another. Uh, we can also identify which of these accounts are actual social bot accounts, automated accounts. And we look for two different sources. One was uh, low credibility sources. These are uh, uh, domains. Uh, they are sharing uh, misleading information and uh, many times verified by uh, professional fact checkers and their counterparts. So the fact checking organizations uh, such as uh, factcheck.org, Snoops, uh, PolitiFact and so on try to kind of like uh, correct these uh, content, uh, misleading content online. And uh, one of the concerns we have here is when you are, uh, when you look at like the popularity distributions of these low credibility and fact-checking content, their popularity distributions uh, look pretty similar to each other. So if you randomly select, let's say uh, a content with thousand engagement, thousand retweets, it may very much be a uh, low credibility source or a fact-checking content as well. And this kind of like creates a problem, like the one on the right-hand side, the popular spreading activity is actually one conspiracy theory about Hillary Clinton campaign and their involvement in uh, Pizza Gates and lots of interconnecting uh, conspiracy uh, co uh, content and events. And uh, looking at like 2016 election, we try to identify how uh, bots have been using and uh, de deploying some strategies to spread this information. And one of the things that we compare with the low credible sources and fact checking, try to understand the strategies of bots is uh, how frequently they post, what are the uh, uh, activities of the bot involvement. So less popular content, we see higher involvement of social bots, uh, but that's kind of like pretty, uh, 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 constant for the fact-checking counterpart. So we know like on Twitter at any given point when we were estimating nine to 15% of bot involvement, that's kind of our range for any fact-checking content, but that rates are uh, reaching quite high up to 60%, 70% uh, for less popular low credibility sources. And the concerning thing uh, as times goes on, as the articles are getting more popular and popular, the bot involvement is also reducing and uh, some of the humans are participating in these uh, discussions as well. 
And in order to better support that, uh, we also look at uh, the uh, activities of retweeting and content creators. So on the x-axis, we have the bot score for a retweeter, and the y-axis, we have the bot score of a content creator, the originator. And one of the things is like when a bot account creates the content, many of these their retweeters are actually coming from the human side. So humans are falling into these misleading content and they are spreading among their uh, follower bases, which is a concern for us. And uh, another strategy that we observe uh, by social bots is how strategic they are in terms of like their timing. So they are uh, trying to push a content early on to create an illusion of something being popular so that human can fall into it as well. So if many bot accounts are retweeting that content, the next human uh, looking at the content and say, this is only retweeting so many times, maybe this is a uh, reliable content and they are more likely to retweet it. And one of the factors uh, that might lead this is like the early bot activities to promoting your content. And this another one is quite interesting. Actually, when we were uh, creating hypothesis for uh, such analysis, we weren't really expecting uh, extremely popular accounts falling into misinformation content, but unfortunately Donald Trump prove us wrong over and over again. So we see he has been retweeting uh, 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 low credibility uh, content and his 67 million followers are uh, weaving that content. So uh, bots are being strategic. They try to manipulate or they try to uh, get the attention of these popular users and which is also different than uh, other uh, less popular accounts. So they are strategic in terms of who to target. And uh, you, usually like when we do an academic research, we all are interested in like our results getting published in prestigious venues, getting citations. But sometimes uh, the things that make us proud as well is the uh, real world impact and seeing our uh, work being uh, mentioned and used uh, places other than uh, academia. So this is an ex uh, one uh, legislative uh, a uh, document from California. So they've been trying to uh, define the terms of uh, terms of uh, both users in social media. And I was quite uh, pleased seeing like uh, our papers are getting cited and uh, used in uh, such legal documents. So that was always great. And uh, also the both use and the uh, online activities, how they are changing our daily understanding. Like uh, earlier, earlier I mentioned uh, about journalists because they have a super important role. They are the gatekeepers of the information, but the traditional journalism and online journalism is quite different things. So previously when journalists are working on a case, they may be doing their uh, due diligence work, analyzing, fact-checking various different sources, but nowadays their incentives are different. They want it to be the fastest, they want it to be the uh, more accessible one, and they have been bombarded by these uh, feedback loops. So anything they publish, they get either positive or negative uh, feedback from their audiences, which make the journalism practices, first, quite uh, challenging, and second, is also a way to manipulate people as well. And in that study, I was looking and uh, looking at large collection of accounts, introducing themselves as either reporter, journalist, executive producers, uh, columnists, and so on. So they are uh, somewhat involved in the uh, in the journalism field. And since we were interested in the English speaking accounts, uh, majority of them are coming from US and Europe, India. So major, uh, mostly English speaking uh, countries. And uh, one interesting fact about journalists is they are the ones that really value getting a verified journalism status. Uh, I think one report were saying uh, majority of them are applying. It's the one profession that really apply this verified status on Twitter the most frequently. And here, depending on the uh, account creation time of those journalists, we can look at what's the percentage of them getting the verified status. So if a journalist account, let's say, created their account in 2009, uh, the chances of they get verified status is uh, almost 15%. And as time goes on, there might be for two reasons. Either Twitter become much more strict in granting uh, verified status to those accounts, or some of these journalists or accounts claiming to be a journalist are not really uh, have such uh, credentials to get a verified uh, status. 
And also interesting, since 2016, the number of accounts recently created and introducing themselves as journalists is also increasing. And that was also an interesting pattern for us. So one question that we ask is like, how can we quantify the both presences uh, in these journalist network? And if we can identify any distinct pattern of interaction and how uh, these perceived authority verified uh, badge is uh, affecting their network. So again, we can look at their account creation time and measure a fraction of both followers among their network. So uh, until 2010, the, the fraction of both followers among their uh, network is quite uh, close to each other. But later on, the difference is getting larger and larger. So the ch chances of one account introduce themselves as journalist and another verified journalist account, the bot composition in their follower network uh, may get quite different. And we can look at the same picture based on their number of followers. So some verified accounts that uh, are not so popular might have a lower bot uh, follower rate, but as they get more popular, their composition in the network, the more bots uh, start to follow them. And this is kind of like in uh, alliance with uh, how bots strategically try to influence those popular influential accounts. And for the uh, non-verified journals, we have an uh, opposite behavior. So these non-verified journals accounts, early on, they are more followed by both accounts, but as they get more human followers, their uh, both followers are diluted. So the fraction is uh, reduced among their follower bases. And that kind of like bring us, can we identify some anomalous follower behavior? So a couple of years ago, there was this nice uh, New York Times article looking for fake follower uh, factories. So they've been analyzing some popular accounts and we did a similar practice for different politicians and uh, journalists as well in that paper. And normally when I, I kind of like presenting this in an, uh, uh, on, uh, non-online setting, I kind of like look for the audience and see whether they can point out the strangely looking piece of this uh, figure. And if you are thinking something is going uh, wrong in that range, you are absolutely right. And let me explain this figure to better uh, understand what's going on here. So on Twitter API, we can get the chronological uh, rank of the followers. So from first follower to the last follower, we can get their uh, ranked information. And for each of these dots on the top figure, we can also ask each of these followers account creation time. So when these accounts are created and that kind of like bring us uh, these two dimensional scatter plot, their rank of following and their creation time. In a normal setting, we can get a follower created anytime before today. So there's a more homogeneous distribution, but in this region, um, we see some activities done in 2015. And in that activity, all these accounts, and we know they are both accounts because the color indicates the botometer score. Uh, they are more red, so that is higher bot, that means more higher uh, bot scores. And all these accounts following that particular politician in 2015 has high bot scores and they all created between 2011 and 13 mostly. And when we look at the bottom uh, figure, like average window of mean bot score, these are also really obvious bot accounts. So something happened in 2015, that account one day has a 60,000 followers and the next day suddenly uh, he got 120,000 followers. So the next 60,000 is a uh, bot account. So he may purchase the bot accounts or someone uh, made these bot accounts follow that person. So it's always tricky to make a right attribution. So I try to be careful uh, when uh, making such attribution. So in politics, anything can happen. But we can look at different accounts. So we can look at different journalists. Uh, this is one journalist looks more organic uh, behavior. Uh, there's lots of like uh, bots. Uh, there's lots of human followers. Uh, there was one interesting uh, journalist. He, he created the, his account in 2016. And right after the account creation, within a couple of months, he get all these bot accounts, uh, 30,000 uh, to be uh, kind of like more precise, and all created uh, late 2016, uh, early 2017, and they all have really high bot scores. And later on, there is more uh, organic activities. And one thing that is really interesting and surprising, this account is one of the verified journalist accounts as well. So that's uh, quite uh, unusual. Or 
there might have accounts trying to per, uh, have fake followers or someone gift them a, a fake followers. So this is like uh, probably late 2016, that account had 10,000 followers, suddenly reached to uh, 15,000 followers. So there's this bump of 5,000 new followers. They all uh, bought uh, likely accounts. And then throughout the history of this account, there are more organic human activities, but there's one strange time where there's this sudden increase of 5,000 uh, uh, followers that are uh, bot accounts. So we can look uh, not only the individual accounts, but their collective behavior of like following one part of the account. And we are uh, doing this for journalists. Recently, we are doing the similar practice for politicians as well. And in that uh, journal competition social science paper, we uh, present this study on uh, journalists uh, on Twitter and how they may be using these uh, and their involvement in social bot accounts. And so far, I kind of like painted a really dark picture of social media, how uh, bots are involved, how politics can be manipulated. But there's also good things happen when we look at social media, grassroots activities, uh, turning the public opinion for the, for the, uh, for the good, public good. And uh, maybe in the remaining of time, I can give a little bit of like what we have been doing recently and uh, in terms of like human behavior. So uh, one study that uh, I did with Johan Bolon at Indiana University, we look for the uh, human emotions and emotional dynamics. So there was one concept called effect labeling uh, in psychology. Uh, and you may have heard it like when you are writing down your feelings, when you are sharing them in some way, it's kind of like having a uh, therapeutic effects. And uh, we try to study that phenomena. And uh, before that, such studies are either done by surveys with uh, more frequent uh, uh, intervals or uh, more fine-grained fMRI studies, but they may only have limited uh, time span. What we did was like really going to social media uh, content and looks hundreds of thousands of people identify when people are sharing their feelings uh, using in a form of like, I feel great, I feel amazing, or I feel sad, I feel terrible, so both positive and negative. And we try to align uh, the, their activities around these uh, emotion venting times and analyze the sentiment before and after by excluding these I feel statements and study how the balance is changing around this uh, content. So for the positive, uh, what we observed was there was a uh, build-up period. So when you are reaching, I feel great, there's actually uh, about an hour uh, interval when you feel starting to get better and better and better, and then you reach your peak point, and then your positive emotions are decaying in an, another one hour. But uh, interestingly, for the negative one, we uh, observe a quite different pattern. So uh, negative emotions build up uh, much early. And once you went your negative emotions, when you say, I feel terrible, I feel sad, the changes, the re returning back to the uh, base levels happens much quickly. So it's kind of like when these negative emotions help us to return our base level much quicker. And we validated it for different uh, tests uh, and measure the uh, significant uh, re re uh, regions uh, and estimate the uh, half-life of these emotions as well. And currently, uh, I've been, uh, I recently received a grant uh, to look for the daylight saving event. And Turkey is actually a quite interesting example and a really nice opportunity to look at it because uh, different than most of the European countries where they have been applying daylight saving regularly in the past 10 years, Turkey stopped doing the daylight saving in 2016. So that gave me an opportunity to look at the short time dynamics of daylight saving uh, for these different regions and also the long time, long time dynamics of the daylight saving effects. So what happens in the winter when we don't have a daylight saving? So when you wake up, it is darker than usual. And we are comparing three different sets of panel. One is the uh, where we did the daylight saving, the short time dynamics. The second is when we don't have the daylight saving in a longer winter period times. And the COVID period, because uh, for some of us, we don't have such a strong social clock that kind of like force us to wake up at certain time of the uh, year or certain time of the day. So we have been analyzing how uh, our emotions uh, uh, are, uh, are changing in these different uh, periods and we can conduct uh, natural experiments 
to uh, estimate some causal effects. So one hypothesis that you might think, and actually the below one is a uh, data that I created for the US uh, population. What happens, for instance, when we have a normal circadian rhythm and suddenly daylight saving happens? So what I observed was after the daylight saving, the first morning, the Monday morning, we tend to be less happy, less lower balance. And within three, four days, we return back to normal level. So we are trying to quantify both these short time dynamics and uh, when we don't have the daylight saving a longer time period. So uh, as I try to kind of like convince you, most of the research that we are we have been doing is requires some interdisciplinary collaboration and approach to manage and model these complicated systems. So I'm interested in, for instance, studying sleep, social and mobility system, mental health as well. And uh, in my group, uh, we have been looking uh, for different problems uh, of science of science. So one of my students who recently get admitted to PhD is uh, studying acknowledgements in uh, dissertations, try to quantify academic support networks and their role in academic success. Another one we look for the interplay between the exercise and well-being daylight saving is uh, the projects that is uh, recently funded. So uh, before I uh, get to the questions, I just want to first uh, thank uh, all the people that I've been working during my PhD and postdoc and some of the funding agencies and to my current team. So hopefully soon uh, we will start sharing our papers and the research outcomes. And one thing that I really value about my team is they are coming from a diverse backgrounds. So majority of them are data science uh, students, but their bachelors are maybe from computer science, finance, industrial engineering. Uh, I have students from psychology and economic backgrounds as well. So such richness of backgrounds, uh, bringing a unique perspective for uh, various uh, projects for us. So recent study that we have been doing with a fact-checking organization called Tate uh, in Turkey. Uh, there, there's a team members from uh, economics, psychology, and political science. And we are analyzing different aspects of like the misinformation about vaccination, what motivates these actors creating misinformation content, how it uh, affects the audience perception. And luckily, I mean, I think this is one fortunate thing we have in Turkey is uh, the uh, vaccine hesitancy doesn't really correlate with the political uh, uh, view, unlike in uh, US or uh, other countries. So it's lack of uh, scientific knowledge or access uh, to the scientific knowledge. So there's uh, an hope in that regard, because once we communicate our findings with the public, they are less concerned about the uh, vaccines. And uh, since this is not a behavioral attitude, they are more likely to be convinced. So uh, maybe I should uh, stop here and uh, thank again for uh, all your attention. So I'll be really happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Anu. So before anyone puts the, the questions on the chat, or if you want to just raise your hand and unmute yourself. So I'll start with the, my first question. So I know that we, we have some, some drawbacks when you try to, to detect this bot. So for instance, we know that Indiana as a whole was attacked by 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 conservative uh, politicians saying that they were specifically targeting trying to to, to censorship uh, the right wing voice. My question is: Did you receive any personal attack? Like people know or people find you somehow? You are linked to to, to the bottom meter. Do you have? Do, did you receive any, any sort of attack? I mean, from time to time, you receive emails. Uh, they usually use the university uh, email, so the group email. Uh, with the recently in Turkey, when we did this uh, vaccine study, anti-vaccine study with Tate, uh, we really get some personal attacks because we identify some of the uh, disinformation actors and we try to delve into what motivates them to spread the misinformation. So we identify uh, 36 key players that are constantly spreading this information. And me and my team get some personal attacks there. So uh, it was interesting. One night, uh, if we were, uh, we get a trending topic actually in Turkey. They were saying the, uh, the Tayyip team should get to the court or something like that. So they made it a trending topic. Uh, that was quite uh, interesting to see, but I mean, uh, I think 
it's an important issue, so we should uh, raise our voice, uh, inform the public the best way we can do. Thank you. Nardo. Sorry, you broke up. Is it me, Joe? Yeah, it's you. Hi, hello. So, hi, no, thanks, thanks for the talk. I actually have two questions, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. So one is, is, is regarding, I mean, the analysis on dynamics on social media, particularly the ones that you present towards the end on daylight savings, right? But I mean, in general, most people, I mean, I guess some of us included, tend to try to discuss regularities, but most of the analysis is done in the global north, right? So nothing is done in the global south. So for instance, um, you take countries like Brazil, where I come from, there isn't a lot of daylight savings in half of the country, right? Uh, what's your view in terms of the universality, I guess, of those uh, studies that try to say that people behave this way in this way when most of the studies is done in Europe or the United States? Uh, when I presented in the US study, I actually look for the... Uh geolocated information as well. So I identified some of these accounts is actually posted at least one tweet from certain region. So uh, from the Australian uh, part, so in the South, when people are uh, speaking uh, English and uh, one of the coordinates there, uh, we see a uh, reverse effect as well. So uh, we haven't fully go into that detail, but when we are generalizing this, it's actually a concern for us as well, because we cannot really take all the English tweets and make a large claim, because there's a significant population, they might be observing the, negative, uh, the opposite effects, so they might uh, actually influence our the effect sizes that we observe in, an, in a negative uh, way. So we need to take into account, uh, and uh, one can do a generalized study looking for only the South uh, countries and uh, and compare for both. So the Turkey example, the grants uh, that I mentioned, the, what makes Turkey speci special in that regard is they stopped uh, applying daylight saving in 2016. So they willingly uh, prefer to have darker mornings and people are waking up at like almost uh, at, uh, at dark and when they reach to their work, the sun's just set. So. We are also looking for the long-term dynamics uh, of these uh, long-term dynamics on these uh, not applying to daylight saving, basically. So we can compare one year that has the daylight saving and the other year that doesn't have daylight saving and uh, how the winter white uh, welding is influenced by that. In fact, I mean, the, the comment about the, I mean, the sadness, right, that people feel a little I mean, sad or something, that is what triggered my question, uh, because, I mean, countries like where I come from, I mean, uh, there, isn't, there isn't any difference in any part of the year. Things I mean, that get darker or light, I mean, it, it, it's going to be a sunset is at six o'clock, sunrise at six o'clock. And, and, and so uh, have you seen if, if, and we used to have daylight savings and now we don't, uh, yeah. for obvious reasons, I suppose. Um, have you have you had a chance to see if <laughs> so if for this the is... long term time for the long term so comparing daylight saving years and non daylight saving years we haven't uh, carried out the full causal analysis on that yet but for the short term dynamics it influences uh, the behavior for a couple of days so that's the kind of like an uh, uh, intervention or one. Uh, uh, stimuli and how you react to it. I think for the longer term dynamics, maybe it will be uh, good to look at like the health statistics health, uh, and the depression statistics and so on. So using medical health course could be a better alternative. So we try to get access to the Turkish Ministry of uh, Health databases to be able to compare uh, before 2016 and after 2016. And my other question, so sorry, but, and I hope this one is brief, is, is has to do with the, the, the work on misinformation, right? That's what Diogo is interested in as well. I mean, recently we've seen, well, recently for me, I suppose, but there is this phenomenon on the birds are not real, right? Uh, that I don't know if you heard this. I mean, there is a uh, group sorry, of I people, miss, I think it's called birds are not real. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know if you heard of it, but it's basically they, they had even like, gatherings in front of Twitter 
uh, saying that they need to change their logo because um, the birds are basically a government drone. So the, the stories that 30 years ago, all the birds got killed. So the pigeons one, them. right? The pigeons. Yeah, so in fact, it's every bird. Uh, but I mean, the, the, we know that that is what I would call some sort of meta fake news because they they are not, I mean, they don't believe birds are not real, but they basically do it as, a, as like almost like a, a the onion kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But it has attracted people who actually believe it to be a real uh, sort of conspiracy theory. And, uh, and I was wondering if you ever had a chance to actually look if the dynamics of things such as this, that um, if they actually follow the same dynamics of real conspiracy, fake news, misinformation uh, that we have, like, yeah, others. Yeah, I mean, so far what we are, have been looking at, as you said, like looking for the population level behavior, what they share, spreading activities. But recently, I'm more interested in looking for the individual level uh, activities, why people tend to believe conspiracy theories, how their environment or the initial mental models are influencing their beliefs. So that's actually the proposal that I uh, submitted to ERC to be able to model the uh, conspiracy belief at an individual level. So if it's found that that's something that I'm going to uh, thrill to study in the next five years. And I really believe it's an important issue because the motivations to believing in a conspiracy may differ from individual to individual. Some may really uh, make the wrong association between different concepts and they strongly believe in it, or the others may uh, just uh, do it for other purposes. So uh, the, this, what motivates the, let's say, Turkish anti-vaccine uh, dis disinformation creators is some of them are really the power. So they wanted to be more influential on the network. Some of them has monetary uh, benefits. So they are selling healing crystals or uh, some uh, uh, medicinal things, herbs and so on, uh, promising them that will have uh, health benefits. So I guess majority of these uh, content creators may not even believe themselves what they are really promoting. So this information that they've been creating. So there might be some other underlying motivation behind those. And I think that really affects. So uh, the ones that are really strongly uh, supporting an idea, there's no way to kind of like change their opinion until these incentives are removed from the system, right? Okay, thanks, man. Thank you. I, I think we are attracting some bots on YouTube. At least we got two comments with this boom ong. I, I didn't check yet what does it mean, but apparently something trying to to remove videos from, from some selections later on. I, I'll check it out. So we have one one more more question here on the chat. So uh, Clodomir was asking if you could explain a little bit more about uh, the concepts of honeypots and annotated accounts. Yeah, so that was a data set uh, collected by uh, James Caverly from, I think, Texas A&M in 2011. So what they did was uh, they created these uh, social media accounts and they automated the content creation, but the content that they create has uh, no meaning, basically. So no real human can interact to any of the content their accounts uh, creates. So they basically look at which accounts are following those, uh, which accounts follow their accounts. And if they are following, a, if these accounts follow an account with minimal uh, information, so they basically doesn't share any useful information in their uh, tweets, they uh, assume they might be social bots. So they randomly follow these accounts and they label the bot accounts in their data sets using such an uh, approach. So it's kind of like one way of uh, annotating through these heuristics. Another way is like trained uh, individuals to annotate uh, the accounts which we follow. Okay, we, are, we are over time already. So any other last minute questions? If not, I'll say thank you again for Anu for accepting this invite and hope you see you soon with your new results. Thank you very much, Diego. Hopefully uh, the next meeting will be like in person in yeah, some conferences or- sure, sure. Thank you, thank you again. Thank you.